Anyway, thank you to the organizers. Uh, uh, wonderful week, even though it's been spring break in a rainy basement, but otherwise uh, it's, been, it's been really inspiring. Anyway, I, I was saying to some of the prior speakers how uh, thankful I was, grateful that they kind of took the tact of maybe giving talks that were kind of user-friendly and oriented to teaching something rather than just impressing the audience. So I hope to, okay, well, anyway, since you have to have something to impress the audience with, if you're gonna go that route, I will at least try to kind of, well, I don't know if teach is the right word, but anyway, explain some things that are on my mind. So, um, yeah, so what I wanna to talk today is <laughs> kind of general kind of mathematical structure uh, kind of born out of, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of the kind of physics background. And I just, but I just want to say that uh, what I'm gonna talk about is for me, kind of, well, it's part of joint work at various different times with these authors. So it's not that there's a one a five person project, but rather just that uh, these are the, the authors who have, I've really learned a lot from and uh, have worked with about this. Okay, <clears throat> so let me start um, just by saying, so yeah, maybe I just say, what is this going to the boundary business? So I'll, I'll explain it, but the, the point is we want to uh, take curves to the boundary of the moduli of curves and understand some of the things we've been discussing. Okay, so that's, okay, now you can, I don't know, <laughs> go into your post-launch coma, but, uh, okay, so let me, so, sorry? Yeah, oh, and then they, <laughs> we were, I don't know how much I can just, uh, you know, be here all afternoon. I don't know, when is the next lecture? It's uh, 4.30, so I have, uh... <laughs> oh. So there was a time, there was a time when David, David BZ and I, oh, there were, is a list about AI. <laughs> we were discussing BZ a lot, and so this was a kind of, anyway. Joke about it. Um, okay, so let me start with uh, kind of some, I, I hesitate to say that, I don't know, even know physical setup or just kind of, I don't know, some physical motivation. Uh, this is definitely in the world of, of field theory as opposed to arithmetic, but um, well, anyway, I hope that there'll be something of interest to everyone and maybe someone will even be inspired to teach us that it's uh, some structure in arithmetic <laughs> as well. So let me just remind you the kind of working context that I'd like to be in is this N equals four super Yang mills in four dimensions. And um, I'll write G uh, for a complex group. Okay, so complex group, so it's not the compact group, but the complex group. Um, and um, I will, I decided to give a talk, which is kind of, I think, completely on one side of S duality, so to speak. So I won't talk about S duality, but that's kind of, as soon as you've kind of said that you're doing this, uh, this subject, you kind of can imagine that S duality is around, but I, I'll, I'll give a talk that won't have, a, I think won't have a G chat. We'll just have a G. Um, okay, um, so the main thing uh, I want to maybe remind you about, I don't know, maybe board organization is not great. I've been told it's not good to write here. Is that correct? Maybe for those in the back? Yeah, okay, so I'll, okay, so starting from here, uh, okay. <laughs> there's no problem with the sounds, but anyway. Okay, so starting from here, we can, we can compactify this 4D theory, this 4D theory on a uh, Riemann surface. Riemann surface X, just have a cartoon of the Riemann surface here, okay? And when we compactify this theory on the Riemann surface, we get a sigma model, so sigma model, mapping a 2D sigma model uh, into the Hitchin system. And I have different notation in the talk for various different times, but maybe just ask me if it gets confusing, but this, I'll just write this for the Hitchin moduli. So this, from my point of view, I'll think about it as a, a symplectic manifold. So like I said, maybe everything here in this talk will be uh, kind of on the A side of T duality, S duality. And uh, I'll think about this really as a symplectic manifold. Okay. Um, and okay, so this is a kind of world into itself, but what I'd like to focus on today is what happens when we think about this as a field theory in this Riemann surface. Okay. So the focus, uh, the focus for today is uh, you know, TQFT structures, structures in this X. Okay. Um, so before I do that, I want to talk about uh, just a kind of brief. All right, so I hope that's about as much physics as I know. So I hope that was, I didn't, uh, anyway. So I want to talk about a kind of just modest generalization of this. Maybe I'll just, um, yeah, okay, what maybe. Structures in X, what does the word mean? 
Where where TQFT structures? I don't know. In I don't know. Is that the run of me? TQFT structures from X. I don't know with respect to X. So I want to be able to do things like cut up X into pairs of pants. I want to. I mean, so the boundary. <laughs> When we take to what we will take to the boundaries, we'll take x to the boundary of the moduli curves. Okay, so that's the, that's what we'll do. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk about just a, I mean, just kind of have some notation for a kind of slight generalization. So a kind of a useful useful and familiar generalization, but one that in this story, it's kind of really seems to be essential to have in mind which is that um, we not only uh, are allowed to say compactify this on a Riemann surface, we can compactify this on a marked Riemann surface if we give some boundary conditions at the markings, okay? So we can also kind of also, oh, is that me? No, okay, compactify on a, I don't know, maybe I'll say marked, marked Riemann surface, let's call it X and S uh, with labels. And I'll say something more about the labels um, in a few moment, but uh, okay, let me just draw the picture. So here's marked, the marked Riemann surface has some insertions. And okay, so there's a kind of a general paradigm from thinking about this all as a field theory for what kinds of labels you can put here. Okay, so there's a purported, uh, what do you say, two category uh, assigned to. Uh, the circle in this story, which uh, we can talk about, but that's not the point of the story. Uh, and so you want to pick a label from this two category. Okay. But uh, and for the sake of this talk, I, maybe I'll just say uh, kind, of the, kind of the examples of labels that we'll see or that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss. Um, so the example of uh, labels will be um, examples of labels for today. So maybe I should say from like, so labels are states. I don't know if I use the right word, states on FS1 in this theory, but examples of labels for today um, will be the following. If I take a uh, loop group, so LG is the loop group of this G, right? and then inside of it, I can take a parabolic subgroup. So parabolic subgroup, parabolic subgroup, or maybe more generally, I can take the derived group of the parabolic subgroup, derived group. Okay, so P mod the derived group is a is a porous. Um, okay, so then I can imagine not studying just this Hitchin system for kind of unramified bungee, but I can add power work level structure at these points. Okay, so I can, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know where the squiggly arrow should be. So now, now I would have M so here and I get arrive at a sigma model into, uh, okay, I don't want to have too much notation, but I'll, I'm going to just write mx, mg, xs, which is uh, maybe, I don't know, I put a kind of a fancy p sub s, I don't know, it's supposed to be parahorics prescribed at all these s's, or maybe maybe the derived groups of parahorics at all these s's. Okay, and this is just this cotangent bundle of bun g, where I have parahoric structure. Okay, um, questions, comments? Okay, so, um, great. Okay, mm -hmm. so the idea that I want to kind of explore and talk about some theorems, some conjectures, is what happens when we take this curve or this marked curve through the boundary of the moduli of curves um, or boundary of the moduli of marked curves and that can mean a couple of different things. One thing it can mean is some kind of collision of marked points, which is interesting and is kind of not so unusual. I mean, I it was very familiar now, I don't know, 30 years since Balenson and Drinfeld kind of taught but many of us to collide these points. Uh, but we can also take the curve itself to the boundary, which is kind of less, less uh, usual thing to do. Okay, so one thing that, uh, Okay, so I said most of this talk is like things I learned from various people. Maybe I should say like uh, uh, BZ and I <laughs> sort of, uh, I learned, well, anyway, we discussed this kind of point of view a long time, but now I want to kind of sort of say something I learned from Xi Wei in our collaboration, a kind of important uh, kind of reformulation of, of these moduli spaces that allows you to go to the boundary in a kind of uniform way, okay? So let me say a kind of, um, a, kind of uh, a useful, I don't know, useful geometric 
uh, reformulation. So, um, so the useful geometric reformulation is that instead of considering, say, Riemann surface or marked Riemann surface with parabolic level structure, we should just once and for all consider a Deline Mumford uh, Riemann surface curve. Okay, so our starting point is now. Um, my notes. Uh, okay, so we'll have a, just a Deline Mumford, Deline Mumford or twisted curve. Twisted curve, curve. Okay, so kind of, I don't know, draw a similar cartoon. Okay, so I have some stacky points. So the, generically, the curve is not stacky. It just looks like a usual curve. But at each of these points, I have automorphisms that are uh, look like mu sub, I don't know, hi, where h is, hi is some integer. So as i runs through all the marked points, I get... Uh, I get different automorphisms. Okay, so so locally, I should say locally, you know, this um, this looks like I don't know in the analytic locally it some looks like something like C mod mu h i, where C is just well, I think we a disk mod mu h i, where a disk is a complex disk, and h i mu h i is acting by rotation. Okay, um, and now one, I mean, kind of one uh, fell swoop, we can compactify this theory on these. I don't know if that actually is kind of uh, just obvious that you can do this in the physics, but anyway, you can, in the math at least. And we get, okay, so let me introduce some kind of a shift notation. Let me just call this X, okay? So there's no longer any S. S is kind of intrinsic to X. X is a Lee Mumford curve that happens to have some stacky points, and I'll just call it X. So it's kind of okay. And the and I'll also have the the kind of um, I also have the kind of underlying say underlying coarse curve, coarse marked curve, which I'll write like X underline S. Okay, so S will be the stacky points. And X is the kind of just forget that there were stacking, stacking points. Um, okay. Um, and now it's a, well, kind of observation. I kind of learned from Zhi Wei, but I think it's kind of standard in the theory of compactifying um, moduli of G bundles that if you study, um, uh, so observation, I don't know, this is probably, you know, someone's theorem, but let me just kind of. Say observation because it, 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 once you've been told it, you can make it just a local calculation that uh, bun G of this X can be rewritten in the following way. So, first, um, there will be associated to any G bundle on this Delene Mumford curve will be a G bundle restricted to each of these stacky points. Okay. So, each of these stacky points, a G bundle on each of these stacky points, maybe I just uh, first I should say. Uh, Pre-observation, pre-observation is that uh, is that uh, kind of bun G of one of these stacky points B mu H is equal to uh, homomorphism C of mu H into G up to conjugation. <laughs> and now this is a kind of discrete amount of information, so we can fix this kind of data. And once we fix this kind of data at each of these points, okay, so, so fix, fix uh, you know, CI uh, at the stacking points, okay, then this will be equal to bun G for some parahoric group at the stacking points on the underlying. Okay, so it's kind of a fancy, I don't fancy at first glance way to kind of reformulate this. Um, okay, so, and maybe, I don't know, maybe here to have to strictly be true, I need maybe G to be simply connected or say there may be some kind of, it may differ by a finite amount, which is interesting, but not, not sort of the point. Okay, so this is a kind of, so far I haven't done anything. Uh, I, I don't plan to do anything, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so far I haven't. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay, so so what we've kind of decided is that 
just, and I don't know, even know if there's kind of version of this in arithmetic, I don't know, I'm just curious, but anyway, so we kind of, we'll always just work with the lean Mumford curves. Never think about, never say, I mean, anyway, we have in mind working with tower level structures, but we can work with, with the domain. Okay, so. There's location of TS is a perfect defined U. What it means of this? Yeah, so fix this CI at the stack, at the stack key points, and it determines, and uniquely determines, I don't know, it determines yeah. a kind of a PPIs, and that's this PS. So for example, if you choose this H big enough and this generic, it will be evil worry. So the exact portion of this PI is a centralized zone. Yeah, yeah, something else. Uh, yeah, and okay, so it's not always uh, a levy, but the levy work, but okay, so fine, I don't. Okay, so, um, okay, so this is kind of pre preamble, but the reason I wanted to kind of reformulate this is that this moduli, where you don't say words like parahoric, is easy to say in families as we move the curve. Okay, so if we say parahoric, I mean, maybe. Okay, I think we tried at various times to really try to say some families of moduli as you deform this curve, but um, but this you can just say, okay, just move the Deline Mumford curve. Okay, so okay, so part two, well, maybe I won't write at the bottom. Question? Yeah, but don't, don't initiate. So is this a, a, a deep observation? I don't know how it looks. So somehow you, you move that deep observation in the curve. <laughs> No, I mean, the word observation was supposed to signify that it's not deep. I don't know. I know, I know. <laughs> I, 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 no, I mean, maybe the thing to say is, I, okay, I don't know. This is good math. I mean, in the sense that, like, I didn't make this. I mean, it's maybe the first person who made the observation was deep. I don't know. <laughs> but once that person made the observation, it's not deep. I don't know. So, I, so we didn't make this observation first. We learned this observation. Uh, uh, if you decide that you're interested in compactifying moduli of vector bundles, you will quickly learn this observation in some shape or form. Yeah. Um, so, so it's a reformulation of something kind of tautological in the language of staking points. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's I don't know how tautological it is. I mean, there's kind of beautiful observation that if you take, uh, you know, say affine Grassmannian, and you rotate the parameter by roots of unity, but the fixed points are surprisingly things you might already know as flag. I don't know, that's Russia. deep or not deep, or I, don't, I mean, partial, it, it, partial, I mean, I should say, affine flag, I mean, of af, partial affine flag, general, general flag, yeah. Is that deep? <laughs> once someone tells you that, it sounds very deep, but it's once you know it, it's not hard to, so that's the kind of content of this. Okay, okay, so now let's, now we're prepared to kind of go to the boundary. Mm -hmm. so, the boundary. Okay, so let me just say yeah. what I mean by this. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I don't know. They kind of, you know, you write mu, I could write Z mod H, but then algebraic geometers don't kind of take you seriously. It's an orbit, Paul. Yeah, okay, I don't, I don't know. Orbit folds. Okay. Um, Okay, so what do I mean by going to the boundary? So let's have the following setup. And everything I'll discuss, I, I, I mean, what, what uh, I've thought about is all in the kind of setting of complex geometry. But of course, one can, I mean, nothing I've said so far, I mean, it's certainly in the, what you would say, geometric setting, not in like number field setting or something like this, but it's, um, there's nothing about complex, except I, I will work with the complex numbers because that's that's uh, where I'm at. Okay, so, um, so let's now have the following. Let's now have a family over a disk. Okay, so it's supposed to be like just a complex disk. Um, and so the family has a kind of generic fiber, let's just write that, epsilon, it's epsilon, generic fiber, which is one of these stacky, smooth and proper Deline Mumford curves. Okay, so this is kind of smooth, proper Deline Mumford curve. Okay. Um, but not generically, it's just a usual curve. I don't know if those assumptions are enough to, to say that generically, it's just a usual curve. Um, okay, and then we have a zero fiber, and I want this whole thing to be a kind of nodal degeneration, which I'll tell you in a moment what that means, but the, the special fiber, this is called X zero, 
will be a kind of nodal uh, proper domain Mumford curve. Okay, so if I drew the general fiber as my cartoon like, like this with some marked points, then the special fiber maybe looks like it is kind of special fiber looks okay. I don't know if it's that picture. It's kind of got smooth components. They split into a node. Okay. And the total space locally. Okay, so what is traditional? I don't know, I'm putting locally meaning like locally in, in this X. Traditionally, what you say to someone is near the node, it looks like you know XY equals T. Okay, so like the curve, I don't know, looks like this and then becomes this kind of nodal curve. Okay, but we want to also allow for this point to be stacky. Okay, so we want to also allow ourselves to divide out this picture by some UH, okay. where it's hyperbolically kind of rotated. Um, and so I don't know. I found it a useful comment that the, you know, depending on H, this is a kind of the coarse moduli of this is a ADE surface. No, no, know what the coarse picture looks like. It's not the total space, not smooth. The coarse picture, but in any case, it looks like this. Okay. So um, okay. So we want to just now to kind of uh, say again what the title means is we want to understand the geometry of bungee here in terms of the geometry of bungee here. And so let me just say, uh, um, uh, yeah, what did I want to say? Yeah, so okay, so let me da, 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 just take this picture and, and pass the G bundles. Okay, so now we can pass to G bundles. We have, I don't know, uh, well, anyway, there's a standard language. So I just mean that this is a stack whose fiber above any uh, point is G bundles on the fiber. Okay, so epsilon here we have bungee uh, epsilon and so on. Above zero, we have bungee x zero. Okay, and so let me just say in uh, kind of uh, some formula, let me just say kind of what, what this Bungee x zero looks like because oh sorry because we bungee this is a kind of maybe not not uh, not as as uh, uh, as familiar um, but the point is that okay so so whenever maybe I just lost color but I kind of had this node there was this kind of h here and then there was maybe a character also so let's say I have kind of a node node of um, node with a given U H uh, G node uh, twisting fixed. Okay, then it's quite easy to describe this this bungee in terms of bungee on. Okay, let me assume for the time being that this separates into two pieces. Okay, so let's assume assume that uh, this say X zero has a single node and it looks like. Uh, kind of an x minus over this node, I don't know, n with x plus. Okay, so something like x minus and x plus. You fancy x. Okay, here's the node n. Okay, then just kind of following the definitions, you'll see that bun g of, um, of uh, uh, x zero of um, Okay, so each of these will be Deline Mumford curves, and I can pass using, I don't know where I wrote it, I can I can use this kind of an identification to write each of them as you know, bun G on each of them as bun G, I don't know, P S minus. I was I sh I'm not supposed to write at the bottom. I'm gonna fit, is it okay? No. <laughs> it's okay for those who have fallen asleep. Let me just uh... <laughs> Right at the top. Okay, so, so what I was writing, bun g is x zero. L let me just assume that there's kind of no marked points anywhere except the node, just for kind of simplicity. So just assume these are, uh, well, okay, say uh, with the, this kind of n and the only stacky point. 
Okay, so then this looks like bungee of the uh, course uh, curve with this, I'm sorry, uh, minus with this mark point. So let's call it N minus when we think of it on this side. And there's some, depending on this twisting data, there's some parahoric that's determined by this. And likewise, on the other side, so there's the course curve, the point, and these get glued over the induced levy bundles. Okay, so at the levy board. Being okay. So this is kind of Roman commented before you can deduce it from this one. Um, okay, so this is the kind of setup. So the setup is that we will try to understand geometry here by splitting the geometry of this. Um, okay, so I want to, uh, let's see, what do I want to do? Uh, yeah, okay, so now I'm ready to maybe state some some favorite cases and some theorems. I think there's a question in the back or not just a theorem. Well, oh, um, when I, in this kind of separating case, if I have this kind of, I don't know, curve, well, this x zero, uh, sorry, with an x minus, and then x plus and an n. Okay, so I normalize, there's, now an N minus and an N plus. I don't know, maybe it's a bit pedantic to write, but I just want to make it clear. Let's go. So this is normalization. Okay. Um, okay, so let me, all right, so part three. Right along. Well, I should say, so I'm going to state some theorems and then I'm going to ask lots of questions. So um, I, I thought maybe uh, perhaps I can ask a question. Please. Yeah, yeah. So when you, what what do you do with, on the, on the, on epsilon side, uh, that gives you a code, this, this uh, stacky point on that side? Right. So, so, um, so, so the local geometry, say, near, kind of this stacky point, mm -hmm. which I kind of have drawn yeah. here, is maybe happening sort of in this, I don't know, kind of in this kind of tube here. Mm -hmm. And you write, I mean, one way to do it, I think the way we did it is you, you kind of write down some local model and then you say what it means for a curve, family of curves to kind of have that local model. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is like, I, I don't, I'm not building for you this family. I'm just saying, if you give me, a family <laughs> locally model on this, it fits into my setup. So, so just, just imagine a smooth the Riemann surface with a with a circle and such that the group Z, uh, Z mod H acts by rotating. Okay. Uh, and then you uh, kind of contract the circle to a point. Yeah. So the, uh, maybe, maybe I do my favorite. The lift it and then the last it. Exactly. Then. Exactly. Yeah. You. In fact, that's kind of the technical thing is that it's going to lift it. Yes. Quotient it, and then you'll be back in this kind of situation. Um, yeah, again, anyway, I find this comment that the coarse singularity looks like this kind of type A surface singularity to be kind of the guide, like that you won't get wrong if you, you know. Okay, so let me maybe, okay, so I want to state a couple of theorems. So, so I want to state a couple of theorems. And then, um, uh, okay, so some kind of low genus theorems. Okay, so, um, and for that, maybe it's good, I'll give you, I mean, they're all kind of examples in the sense that theorems are in some sense about examples. So a kind of a favorite example, so uh, is to start with, um, this one is to start with uh, the curve Say okay, the, the, the Deline Mumford curve to be P one mod mu H itself. Okay, so this is no this. Now, so it has two stacky points. It's just rotating a P one, so it has two stacky points at zero and infinity. Okay, and kind of by kind of assume, let's assume uh, I don't know if simplicity is the right word or maximal interest. Let's assume that the twisting data at both of these points is generic. 
Okay, so this corresponds to Iwahori level structure at each of these points. Okay, so assume kind of generic C at zero infinity so that this kind of bungee of this P1 and mu H with these kind of twisting types at zero and infinity is exactly, uh, can be written as bungee, I don't know, B of P1 with, you know, Iwahori level structure at zero infinity. So, <laughs> okay, um, and now <clears throat> this, um, what do you say, this, uh, this curve has a favorite kind of, uh, what do you say, degeneration that we call bubbling, okay, so this kind of X, maybe I won't try to write equations and so on, although I, mean, I guess you can just literally write equations in the plane, but anyway, this, this X will just be the family that takes, you know, this curve and bubbles it, okay, so here's zero infinity, zero infinity, and I'll arrange it so that here there's also kind of uh, H symmetries. Okay, so there was mu H symmetries already here and here. They're far away from any of the action, they don't change, but then I also will put the same kind of H here, and I'll always assume that, uh, that uh, so it's kind of degeneration, this is my family, okay. and I'll always assume that C everywhere, C uh, kind of at the node, let's call it N, and N is generic. Question or comment? Um, okay. Uh, all right. So let me just uh, kind of state a the first theorem proven in paper with G way, which is uh, maybe state kind of some slightly informal version of it. Let's consider uh, sheaves. Uh, so we just say uh, uh, topological sheaves, so complex vector spaces, on this bungee P1 to H, this generic twisting, okay? So, um, okay, so it's not difficult to prove first that, like I said, it's this, and then there's a kind of standard radon transform argument that says that this is the isomorphic to the affine Hecke category, okay? But the theorem we proved, that's involves this bubbling structure is that this is a monoidal equivalence. Monoidal equivalence, um, where what where's the monoidal structure coming from? So when I bubble, I can take nearby cycles, and the monoidal structure is an adjoint to nearby cycles. Okay, so, so here we have the usual convolution, and here we have kind of adjoint to nearby cycles. Okay, so these two match. Yeah, and then it's a legitimate question, but uh, do you know in, again, how to decategorify do you have an analog of this on the level of function? Uh, we can discuss later. Yeah, okay, I mean, yeah. And this does not depend on age, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, what, well, it, it depends on H being big enough that I can define C to be generic, and then, mm -hmm. then it doesn't play any role. That's the question. So how does this identification between mu H and, and Xi and Parahoric uh, work in local langlands, meaning once I have this P, it uses an element in local langlands, right? yes. in the two categories of local langlands, yes. and then it has an S2 world. Yes. Uh, can I express that S2 world also in terms of the uh, mu H? And data. Okay, I'll say yes because I don't know. Uh, I was told that if you know, of course, uh, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> S duality is true, but but I, I haven't thought. I mean, I mean, we usually I don't know. Uh, in my way of thinking, I usually kind of think of puncturing, but probably you can say uh, because I think that the sort of things that Pavel was encountering for real version of the story has to do with new true and the data. Uh, so maybe at the, by the end, if I get so I say something about real as well. Uh, but for the for the moment, nothing uh, sort of so sophisticated. Okay, so I, I say okay. So this is a theorem that uh, kind of I state only so I can kind of kind of maybe explain the next theorem. 
But uh, one comment I want to make that I think is interesting to a kind of, uh, you know, kind of a conjectural picture, which I think uh, we state in the paper that proves this theorem, is that if you suppose you didn't do this with twisting, you could imagine bubbling this P1 in all sorts of different directions. And so you hope, I mean, you expect that you can prove in a kind of very natural way that the Sataki category is E3 uh, by doing this kind of bubbling in all directions. Okay, so conjecture the E3 structure, which uh, I think has been established on uh, the Sataki category, comes from uh, this kind of bubbling. So usually it's explained in terms of some combination of convolution and fusion, but this is a kind of uniform picture that uh, I should have one, uh, maybe, I don't know, I just gonna, if I'm supposed to uh, try to convince you this story is worthwhile. But one, one, um, one thing I like about this story is you don't write, I mean, we're not writing on any local moduli here. So once we've kind of proved this theorem, we kind of have all heck operators just in these global moduli, which are, well, okay, I don't know, finite dimensional stacks and so on. Is there a question? Okay, so maybe I want to state now, I think I want to state a second theorem. Uh, and then ask lots and lots of questions of the audience. Okay, so this was one example that we can, oh, this is one example where this kind of bubbling uh, kind of gives you a structure that you, you know. And now I'd like to do a, a kind of a second example. I'd like to take, uh, you know, X, X is an elliptic curve and a genus one. Okay. And I'd like to look at say, like a Tate family. I'd like to look at just a, a kind of nodal degeneration of the elliptic curve. So I don't know. So here's my here's my elliptic curve. Here's my elliptic curve. Ah. <laughs> you draw it goes like this. Okay. Here's my elliptic curve, and um... okay. So there's different things we can write down, but in any case, let's uh, bubble it to a nodal elliptic curve. And where again we have this kind of mu h symmetry. Okay, so maybe x zero equals uh, equals you know this one from before. So this p one mod mu h, and then I identify zero with infinity. <laughs> maybe with some say something about the automorphisms, but anyway. Uh, uh, so th this works for any h or just the any h, h? Any h. Sorry, it, uh, I mean, at this point, I just can write, I mean, I don't know, I write down a family, any H. I mean, all I care about is that H is going to be big enough that you can write down a kind of generic C. So let me, let me, in fact, as I've done, maybe I should have done at the beginning. You're saying it can be defined for any H. Yeah. I mean, well, okay, so there's, <laughs> we've had lots of, okay, I don't know, maybe I defer to Jiwei what, Okay, let me, yes, it's kind of, this is for any, any. So, so assume the usual, can I just say? Yeah, please. Uh, start with the usual nodal degeneration. You can make a modification to it. Maybe base change to kind of uh, another base to make it a little bit of arbitrary. So, so basically you have a point support the H and you have to go, so the Z mod H will add, and then you can contract the, that circle to a point, basically. Like, but but if this is local, I mean, if you know, if you, I don't know how I drew it. If you, I mean, the only part that's getting, you know, if you, uh, okay, maybe what he said is correct, I'm not sure. Yeah, we can discuss later. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, okay, so now uh, a theorem, uh, okay, maybe I don't know what, what the the. Uh, uh, I only pause for Jiwei, but I, I suppose for quotes or anyway, a theorem in progress. I don't know <laughs> a theorem that uh, you know I, I think should should be proved soon uh, with Tong Wei Li. Jiwei um, is that okay? So uh, here maybe I I like I said we had this kind of radon transform here we. Uh, and I said, sorry, I said that convolution corresponds to the adjoint to nearby cycles. So here we have a kind of a nearby cycles on these moduli spaces, and then an adjoint to nearby cycles going the other way. And that turns out to be the kind of universal uh, trace map. Okay, so if I take sheaves uh, with, okay, so nilpotent singular support, 
which are topological shapes with no potent singular support. And I take this uh, kind of bubbling Hecke category, maybe I just call this, just by definition, I call this H the bubbling. Okay. So I have this H uh, bubbling of G, and I take its co-center that the adjoint to nearby cycles descends to this, this co-center and gives an equivalence. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe I just say uh, uh, a word or two. Okay, so you, I mean, this, this, I don't know whether it's better to formulate in terms of the bubbling. The bubbling is more natural geometric, but of course is equivalent to the affine Hecke category. So it's a calculation also of the co-center of the affine Hecke. Um, okay, so maybe I just make a, a comment for Dobby Day. I don't know. So, so if you, you know, um, uh, so you can, you know, this is uh, uh, the I don't know, co center is Hochschild homology, and we're taking the kind of S1 compactification. This, this monoidal category governs what we assign to the circle, and then we're taking S1 compactification to get, getting what we would expect to get if everything were topological. And then so, so, yeah. Okay, so, um, and maybe I just make a comment. All right, so this theorem, it doesn't appear, but a theorem that uh, uh, does appear, although I'm not exactly sure how to fit it into this, is let me just say a calculation that's interesting here is there's a, a kind of a favorite object here called the Whitaker function. And uh, you find a paper by these authors that calculates endomorphisms of the Whitaker functor, functional. So let me just say for kind of... Um, Simplicity, let's just assume G is simply uh, connected. Uh, connect. No, uh, G is adjoint. Um, then this is just functions on T check plus T check plus T check shifted by one. Just so a calculation of an object inside this, uh, this cat. So we say. Ah, it's in the conference. I mean, it's, well, <laughs> it's the, the quotient. Yeah, so, so, so that, I mean, depending on how you read this, I'm kind of mixing two theorems just because I think this is kind of an interesting kind of comment to make. So once you, okay, so the co-center is identified with this, this category. Inside this category, there's an object, the Whitaker object, okay? If you already know the co-center is identified with this, okay, then your life is easier, but you can think of this object here or here, but under this equivalence, okay, same object, you calculate endomorphisms and you get this spectral description. Sorry, it, it, it doesn't depend on the variable or it will generate. Yeah, it doesn't. Okay, so okay, now I'm going to get to the questions. Okay, so so now, now let's uh, maybe the last. Okay, maybe I think I probably won't say anything about real things, but let me just say lots of questions, including uh, questions about dependence on elliptic curve. Okay. Um, so, okay. So anyway, this is kind of the main theorem I wanted to. to so, so, so is it some sort of derived commuting step? Uh, that's the spectral side, but we're yeah. not doing anything uh, kind of on the spectral side. I mean, th 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 this is functions on the kind of derived. So I know Jimmy uh, spoke recently about his work on this derived commuting step. So does it help understand this step? You know, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I decided, okay, the, the, the one more, I mean, I lied. In the beginning of the talk, I said there would be no uh, G check. And then uh, Pasha caught me, of course. So, okay, so so there's one place where there's some Langlands duality that if you calculate this endomorphisms, you will get this answer. But like, uh, okay, but anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, no, no duality in this. Um, okay, so I want to now maybe just in the last fifteen minutes ask lots of questions. I don't know. This is some kind of you know. Uh, I, I didn't, <laughs> you know, you think you're preparing a really interesting talk. Maybe, maybe you don't think I was preparing a really, anyway, I think you're preparing a really interesting talk and then you realize, okay, I'm just kind of re rewriting my NSF proposal. So, <laughs> so now we reached the part where I tell you all the things that I would like to know that I can't, I mean, maybe I'll be able to prove in the next three years, I don't know, <laughs> but I would be very happy, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so so I really like to just um, state some some interesting questions that I think would be good to discuss. I don't know the answers to these. Um, okay, so but they're kind of born of this. Yeah, I mean they're born of like maybe starting with this theorem. 
uh, questions that can relate to important to teach public success some questions. Um, okay, so maybe first questions will be about symmetries. The first questions will be about symmetries. So maybe Balkanan asked about S okay, dependence on the elliptic curve. Um, okay, so um, so this category, okay, I didn't write a modulus for the elliptic curve, but I mean, what, okay, so I, maybe I should sort of say, so this, this, this category is not difficult to show is independent of the elliptic curve. You want to give a direct, a direct proof. Of course, one can also now prove kind of maybe everything in the universe. I don't know if Sam is in the audience right now, but anyway, geometric Langlands has been, as we understand it, has been established. So there's kind of also, I mean, so I don't know whether one should say like, okay, you know, by geometric Langlands, one could, but that's like maybe overkill. So here you can really prove this is independent of the, the curve. Um, so there's, um, there's kind of SL2Z acts on this, this, uh, this category by monodromy transformations as you go around the modulo inverse. And, and all of these questions that I'm going to ask, I should say, are kind of maybe not, I don't know if they're interesting, but they're kind of like just maybe straightforward geometric questions about, say, this category. But the point is with this theorem in hand, then you can ask, what do they mean about, about this, this category, okay? So one thing I want to say is this equivalence depends very much on the choice of the vanishing cycle. Of like Pasha was constructing this kind of Tate family. It depends on the choice of the vanishing cycle. And now we're deciding to kind of move the vanishing cycle to something, some other vanishing cycle. So, okay, so these are not gonna be kind of, uh, kind of precise questions, but uh, maybe one question to ask is, what is the relation in Roman's talk we had this, uh, or a transform. Okay, so is, is there a relation to like Lustig or a transform or other 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 structures? I mean, if, if if no, still like don't give up, but other structures on the cocenter. Okay, so I think that's a really interesting question that I don't know the answer to. So th this this category as the cocenter has very preferred objects like characters of certain representations. Um, but then when you kind of do these SL two Zs, it's it's some interesting symmetry. But okay, so that's kind of one one uh, I don't know uh, A okay uh, B um, okay. So there's another beautiful structure here. So this is like we've been discussing locally constant in the uh, uh, maybe I guess I'm not using locally constant. The issue is invariant under the automorphisms of the the elliptic curve. So I get this, this category has a topological, topological S1 cross S1 action on it. Oh, I should say, uh, I, I think specifically of BC. I mean, may, may, maybe the answers to some of these questions are known even to my collaborators. I don't know, but I'm gonna ask the questions anyway. <laughs> so, okay. So there's this S1 cross S1 action and one can, as we know to do, if, if nothing else in that, when we have an S1 action, we should take some kind of uh, invariance and then maybe periodic invariance. So, okay, so periodic, so explain the geometry of the periodic cyclic, uh, periodic cyclic invariance of this. Again, with the idea that one of them should have to do with the loop rotation on the loop group and the other should have to do with the cocenter, but they're kind of completely now you know, unbiased. So that's a kind of interesting. Yeah, there is also a Zima two. Uh, that there is also a Zima, which which the elliptic curve goes x goes to minus x. Is that x goes to minus? Ah, there's also a Zima two. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and is that, 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 that part of SL two Z? Is that the no? Maybe not. I don't think. So. <laughs> is that it? Okay. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe that's S in S one cross S one. I don't know. Okay. Anyway. Uh, Yes, if you find more symmetries of this picture, I invite you to. Uh, um, okay. Um, okay, so let me formulate uh, some other questions now. Um, so I want to also talk, I mean, maybe it's kind of slightly like dual to Roman stock. I also want to talk about functionals on this category, okay, or on, I don't know, this category. Okay, so two, let me ask you some questions about functionals. 
Okay, so um, okay, so on the one hand, on the one hand, um, if I give you, for example, a group element in the loop group, it naturally gives you, okay, I wrote here bubbling, but it naturally gives you a functional on uh, the cocenter of the affine Hecke cap. Okay, so on the one hand, uh, given a group element G in the loop group, okay, so that you think that you're doing some kind of theory of character sheaves, and if you pick a group element, you should be able to ask what the value of that sheet is. So you get a functional, so you get a functional going from the cocenter of the affine Hecke category, which is this bubbling Hecke, uh, uh, Hecke category, you get a, a functional to vector spaces. Hey, I don't know, functional F sub G. Okay. Yeah, uh, orbital interval. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, I'm just, I mean, there are many other things you could do, but I'm just pretty, I don't know, the simplest thing you could possibly do. If someone says, I have a character, you could ask what's its value when it works. I mean, if you think about the fine hanging guy, she was just computing the stock of this. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you, maybe it's even this exists. Sorry. It's a trace. I mean, it's a character shift. The character shift. When you say trace, what do you mean? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so on the one hand, you have this, and on the other hand, um, if you take uh, kind of this realization, there are lots of interesting functionals. So given, um, uh, given say, a generic, say, a, a, I don't know, a nilpotent generic, nilpotent Higgs field, I don't know, maybe I just won't use letters for it at this point. You can assign some microstock associated to it, going from uh, on the, in the elliptic curve. I mean, yeah, uh, from Jeeves N. Oh, sorry for writing at the bottom. From GE to Vect. Okay, so, uh, so a question I'd like to understand is what kind of transition matrix should one kind of find between these two different types of functionals? Um, and let me give you a kind of maybe just a I make this a little bit more kind of uh, specific, I don't know, sort of in particular. Okay, so I'm interested in the kind of alternate going from between these two, there's kind of some sort of transition matrix. So let me just point out that the in this story, what you would call the Springer sheaf, the affine Springer sheaf, is the zero Eisenstein sheaf on the elliptic curve. Okay. So in particular, the kind of affine Springer sheaf, uh, I don't know, on LG is found in various, I mean, various different people's works, at least its fibers are found in. I mean, it's the calculation of these functor, functionals, and it's of course a main theme in mathematics. The affine Springer sheaf on LG corresponds to the zero uh, Eisenstein series on bun G of E. So any kind of categorical invariant you can extract from an affine Springer sheaf, if you believe that your invariants are categorical should be extractable from this kind of Eisenstein series. So it's something interesting. Um, okay, and let me say kind of one more, and then I think I'll I'll, I'll quit while I'm I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say ahead, but anyway. Um, so so the last kind of uh, one two three last up here uh, thing I'd like to ask about is the center. Okay. So, uh, so here we're in a situation where the center of the affine Hecke category is not uh, isomorphic to the cosine. So this is a situation where it's not Kalan Yao. The monoidal category is not Kalan Yao, and these two are different. And it would be very interesting to describe this in a kind of elliptic description.
So in other words, if some kind of automorphic category on the elliptic curve, that is the actual center, not, not just the... Um, the whole logic of the cross amber was that first he gave an equation of the steady curve. Uh, yes. And then I said that the elliptic just comes to a degenerate curve. Right. Uh, it looks like going to do this. Um, doing elliptic interpretation is not a first step. It was not the first step of this interpretation. Okay. Well, we can discuss. I mean, I think it's not, I don't think it's uh, crazy in the sense that, well, okay. On the spectral side, there's a, there's a perfectly good description of the center in terms of the commuting step. So, okay, anyway, so, so um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, would, I would be very, very interested if anyone wanted to discuss any of these things or teach me uh, how to solve any of these things. Let me just say what I didn't talk about um, is, um, well, okay, so maybe I just draw a cartoon about uh, kind of maybe, I'll, sorry, I lied, uh, say something. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, kind of uh, if I had time, there's a whole kind of idea of studying kind of real Langlands. And I want to talk about a, a role. I just want to draw a picture that I think is a, well, I can prove theorems using this picture. And I think there's probably more theorems to be proved. Um, and I'm going to call this picture something like Galois decoupling. I don't know, that sounds kind of very uh, fancy, but anyway, I don't know. It's not supposed to be. Uh, so real Langlands means that you consider sheets on the real points of the Yes, yeah. just like you. You consider functions on the anyway, whatever, whatever we all agree with there's some real moduli, and we consider some kind of automorphic space or category associated with real moduli. We want to do some harmonic analysis. Yes. And what I want to kind of point out is <clears throat> there's this kind of beautiful picture where if your real curve, I don't know, I, I'm not really interested in higher genus, but like, okay, I mean, I, maybe I just draw like P1, but anyway, if your real curve is um you know has say these real points okay so here's your your complex conjugation this is your oval and just talk then um we can take that to be a vanishing cycle okay so we can kind of degenerate this curve with this kind of point going here and what you'll notice now is the kind of Galois action is almost free it's free except at the single point mm -hmm. so you kind of are in the place where before you thought you were doing some kind of you know, very complicated real structure, global real structure. Here, the only kind of real structure is happening completely at a point. It's kind of an interesting thing. So like one thing you can prove with these kinds of things, maybe I just, and then I'll stop, is just say like- The boundary states. Sorry? It's like boundary states in the- Yeah, you can, I mean, you're okay. you want to under, if you think about this as some kind of, um, well, okay. So I just, I just want to say like something, maybe I just say informally, a theorem that, uh, with and Chen is that um, these kind of real moduli, real moduli uh, often have complex singularities. And the method of proving this is like, is this kind of thing. So you what, what does it mean? So these kind of, we have these kind of automorphic moduli associated to this uh, kind of real curve. Okay. And we do some degeneration We've proved some theorems about what happens under the degeneration, and here there's almost no real geometry left. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean complex singularities? Okay, so you have uh, everyone's favorite, uh, I don't know, uh, what x squared plus y squared minus z squared, is this right? <laughs> equals zero. Okay, so this is a, did I draw it right? Okay, so that's a, <laughs> that's a real quadric, and, uh, but it also has a description as like, I don't know, z1, z2, Equal okay, so I think physicists will say that this is some kind of hyperkeller rotation or something. Mm -hmm. Ah, so they have simple, there is a complex structure in which the singularity is a holomorphic. Yeah, but it's not even, this singularity is not even smoothly equivalent to this. I mean, it's mm -hmm. something kind of more bizarre has happened. Okay, anyway, I think that's it. Thanks very much. Question for Dave. I know you said you came up with some higher genus, but suppose we would discuss higher genus then the generations can be on our genus. Yeah, so so Jiwei and I wrote a paper which um, constructs a kind of a general kind of uh, candidate gluing functor, I mean independently of genus or anything like this. 
Canon means that uh, you don't know that it's equivalent. Well, okay, so now we live, I don't know, post, I don't know, Sam, after tomorrow afternoon, maybe we know it's equivalent. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but. Um, but we we didn't we didn't prove it's an equivalent. I mean, the theorem I stated here is kind of proved internally using kind of a geometric representation theory as opposed to I don't know sophisticated homotopical and other algebraic geometry. Uh, but in general, I, I mean, you're all the point that we should believe in them. Yeah, um, and it's probably now also I don't know whether Sam's thought about it. It's probably an I mean probably proved to be an equivalence as a consequence of. Just know we know it's an equivalence on the other side, right? So, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, oh, sorry, maybe I should have said so. Nice. Long ago, BZ, Holy Prego, and I proved, well, BZ and I proved some, uh, some gluings. And so, anyway, I think it's probably, you know, there's, there's a square in which, uh, you know, Sam will complete the last leg of the square. So, probably you can kind of prove lots of other things that are also equivalences of the square. Yeah. Uh, so I understand that you have spent a relation of most exact coordinate lens one because you think of one no coordinates in the most important one to you as kind of elliptic character cubes. Yes. Yeah. Or affine character shapes. But uh, I was wondering at the level of dysfunctions, not sheaves, mm -hmm. is there any evidence for the relationship or? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether uh, we have some experts who I would refer you to, I mean. Uh, I guess another question is a uh, so, Oh, uh, maybe I say one thing, which is just to, to kind of, I don't know, so uh, Pang Wei Li it was uh, kind of, and is really an expert on this. He and uh, Sam Gunningham have some, I don't know, the, uh, I don't know the right uh, kind of words to describe, but there's kind of, kind of a beautiful combinatorics of classifications of uh, elliptic uh, like elliptic character sheets, character sheets on the semi simple curve. And so they probably know, humans probably know the answer to your question, I think. My second question is uh, in geometric lines and another curve, what replaces the uh, modular global systems? Geometric. Ah, so, so in the perspective we, uh, you know, I took in this talk, is uh, we don't ever um, really think of the nodal curve. I mean, as a as a as its own like yeah. as its own object. Yeah. In fact, there's a kind of beautiful kind of point of view that the nodal curve. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it is literally that thing. That the, that the nodal curve is a kind of three dimensional cobordism between the smooth curve and the normalization. So, in fact, you should sort of think of the nodal curve as being just a kind of pathway. A visiting point along the way that you needed because uh, you couldn't describe everything as topological from the start. That's a very interesting picture. Yeah. So, so in some sense, the the theorem that I raised is kind of really about this and this, with this just being. I would advertise uh, my protocol shifts on the nodal curve as a possible answer to the question. Any further questions, David? No, good for me. I, no, no, I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Michael Okoshi is a nodal curve, is also a good thing to. Okay, yeah, so could, could you say uh, some, something when uh, this site is non generic, say when well, H is Y? Yeah, so, okay, so <laughs> uh, one thing I've learned from doing this, I laugh because, like, you know, like when you and I were thinking about this, we kind of thought, okay, we'll just do the. C is generic, and like if you understand the affine category, you understand everything. And every time we kind of try to proceed, we realize we kind of need all everything. And so, okay, so we didn't write it, but we need to uh, uh, write that you know for any C, you get this kind of uh, bicoset, or what you say, bicoset stacks for uh, parahorics, and that all of the kind of bubbling structure matches kind of bimodules and convolution patterns you expect. So um, I don't know if I'm, am I answering your question? So, okay, yeah, so it's, it's, we didn't write it, so you won't find it. It's, it's... Maybe I have a neat question. So you kind of advertise this point of view, you know, working with orbital curves because it's easy to deform them, but actually how do you deform them? So uh, how do you... Yeah, what sorry, maybe I said the right, not because the of these... Point, yeah. yeah, yeah, not, I mean, of course you can just, I mean, we don't, in some sense, all our theorems are like, you give me a family of 
of say orbifold curves and then I plug it in, yeah, but the point, sorry, maybe I shouldn't have said the word deform. The point was that when you get to the nodal curve, if you wanted to find a moduli of G bundles that is like the correct moduli and you want it to look like it has parahoric, uh, I mean, okay, maybe, maybe let me answer it with a reference. So you generic so, curve is smooth with no orbital. If you like, yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, there's a kind of faulting's proof of um, Berlinda formula. If you look at that paper, he exactly is kind of looking at families like this, like LG degenerating to a curve on a, a G bundles on a stacky curve. So the point is to get this kind of, you know, you want LG, just like, you know, for, like if you look at a like Vinberg degeneration, you want to degenerate G to kind of upper and lower triangular matrices. Okay, maybe you write down some equations. If you want to degenerate LG, you write down some equations, but then if you want it to be kind of, I don't know, something you can glue together globally, you realize that a good language to do it is the orbital curves. But, but, but for these purposes, like well, curves, smooth curve with only four points is as good as just a smooth curve, basically. Yeah, I think for all, I don't know, I don't know for all purposes, I don't know, <laughs> you know like, I don't know any, I mean, it's just like- Except, Well, I mean, when we compute Euler characteristic, you will get fractions. <laughs> then, then it's, otherwise, it's this thing. Yeah. Fractions seem okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask so, is there a topological factorization category here? So, this uh, shifts n of bound g of some x. I mean, uh, like in uh, factorization homology, you put a category on every surf topological surface. Yes. And so I mean, is that an example? I mean, the meta, I mean, the meta conjecture, I mean, I don't know, like, we're just proving like a tiny little piece of a giant conjecture, which is that there's maybe a 4D or almost 4D field theory here. So we're proving like one, we're very, I mean, what I then will do today, the, the, everything would, I mean, so, so my, my, my point is we're just like, well, the theorems today is literally just saying that if there is this field theory, then when you take a cylinder and glue it like this, you will get a, something that you got, you assign to the, you know, two torus in the theorem. Okay, so that's the theory about the cosenter. I mean, the theorem about the cosenter. But one expects that there's a fully extended theory. It may not go all the way up to four dimensions, size issues, but, and then, and then I won't try to answer any of your questions kind of, uh, you know, what do you say in an ad hoc way? I just say like anything you know about, you know, that starts from a three category assigned to a point and has some topological field theoretic structure will be true. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's conjectural. Let's thank David for the